There is always trouble brewing in the East. You hardly need it from the Sibyl's mouth. The yellow sounds of discord are brought forth by the ill winds that blow out of the South. You know, Pheidippides was not the man who ran from the battlefield of Marathon to the Acropolis. He actually ran an ultramarathon from Athens to Sparta. My commitment is to, to do the best that I can, just to leave it all out in the course. I think about touching that statue every single day and kissing the feet of Leonardo. It's what keeps me going. I mean, I live for this. I'm human, I have self-doubt, and um, I have anxiety and worry about the outcome of this race. Well, mentally, I don't feel 100% okay, but I'll handle it. It gets difficult now, okay? This is where you gotta, you got to start digging a little bit deeper now. Finish the race. Well, you don't finish the race. There's, there's no halfway hatch anyway. Dipides was running to save his family. Uh, he knew the, the invading Persians would slay his family. It would be the end of Greece. He was running to save democracy, to save what has become Western thought. So you're, you're giving up, are you? everyone, welcome back to In the Spotlight. I am just very excited to have Dean Carnezis uh, with us today. He is a famous runner. He's a world famous runner and we're very proud of him because he's a Greek American that hails from California. His family, his roots come from the Peloponnese and Ikaria. And so he's a special guy and he's done a lot of special things. He's gonna talk to us about all the wonderful marathons he's been part of, how he started running, and the wonderful documentary feature that he was in called The Road to Sparta. Welcome to our show, Dean. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me run by. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, I'm a big fan. Uh, I, you're great. I think I speak for a lot of Greek Americans that follow your work and not only Greek Americans, Greeks, uh, Greek diaspora in general and Greeks in Greece, because I saw your TED talk, you, it was a packed house and you've done a lot of wonderful things with Greece. I'd like to start off about uh, talking about your uh, recent documentary, and then we're going to go a little bit into about your life and how you got into running. Um, uh, you, you worked uh, along with uh, Barney Spender and Rod Gibson on the Road to Sparta, which tracks four runners, uh, uh, including yourself, the ultra marathon man. Um, and you guys did a the ultimate race, the greatest race, the hardest race, like six marathons in one, the uh, Spartathlon. Uh, and they followed uh, you guys. So tell me a little bit about that and, and how this uh, all came about. Well, the, uh, the Spartathlon race, for those of you watching that are unfamiliar with it, it's a 153 mile foot race from Athens to Sparty. And it follows the route of the ancient foot messenger, uh, Phidippides or Phidippides, uh, who was the, you know, the, the, the father of the marathon. So before the marathon, he ran all the way from Athens to Sparta and this race recreates it. So it's quite grueling as you can imagine to run 153 miles nonstop and you only have 36 hours to complete the trek or else you get disqualified. So it's one of the toughest endurance races in the world. And of course, being Greek, I, I just had to do it. And you know, when you're running for 36 hours, I mean, imagine most people, when they run for one hour, they feel a little bit tired and beat up. Imagine running for 30 hours, continuous, in southern Greece, you know, in the heat of uh, the September uh, southern Greece um, region. Uh, and, you know, having a, a film crew documenting you um, at every step of the way, it's, you're kind of revealing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you're just not at your best after running 30 hours. So uh, it's kind of a raw experience. And I think they did a masterful job of capturing that with the documentary. Now, is this the first time you, you ran that Spartathlon? It was the first time, yes. Do they run it annually in Greece? It's an annual race. And it's, it's funny, 
Uh, those that know about the Spartathlon know its lore. It's, it's probably the most celebrated ultramarathon in the world. But so many uh, Greeks themselves don't even realize about the Spartathlon. I'm, I'm always surprised when I'm in Greece and mention to someone I'm running the Spartathlon and they say, well, what's this? They don't know about it. And well, let's help, them, let's help them learn about it. And that's what you're doing. You are doing, you're just really championing this and you're, you're really helping uh, get the word out to the world. Uh, and through you, I'm sure you can bring, at, you know, runners every year, make it like a big, you know, special, like make it uh, something to look forward to every year for runners. Well, it's, it, it draws an international field, the Spartathlon. And every year there's about 350 people that attempt it. So it gets a good um, turnout and about half of those people are Greeks. So it's, it's very well represented. And uh, like I said, it's one of the most coveted races uh, in the endurance sports world in the world. So, you know, to finish the Spartathlon is an incredible accomplishment and not many people have done that. So the story is uh, for our audience that uh, uh, the runner that you had mentioned earlier, Fidipides, he ran from Athens to Sparta, uh, 246 kilometers on, I, I don't, I think barefoot he ran uh, right. to, to ask these Spartans to come help them with the invasion of, of Persia at the time. Uh, it is a great story. It's relived every year. And uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, marathon runner here, our famous marathon runner, Dean Karnazes, joined uh, this uh, run, this marathon, and is sharing the story with us and this documentary that's coming out at the Hellenic Film Society uh, shortly. And I hope you all get on there to see it. Um, now, you've also written a book, Dean. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so the book is called The Road to Sparta, and it's basically the story of uh, Pheidippides. So I did a lot of research on ancient Greek history. I worked with uh, Professor Paul Cartledge, who's one of the foremost authorities on ancient Greek history. And I really dove into Herodotus. I, I collected all that I could on, from the ancient record to recreate what actually happened um, you know, in 490 BC. And then I went to Greece and researched the route and ran it myself. So using only the foods that Fidipides used, uh, I ran with- Barefoot? Just, Did you run barefoot? I ran a marathon barefoot. I, I didn't <laughs> run the entire 246 kilometers because it was, a lot of it is on the road and running barefoot is nice on a trail, but on the road is not so nice. Right. But I did eat um, only figs and olives and I only drank water. I didn't use Gatorade or any sports performance drinks. So I tried to recreate as best I could um, the conditions that he went through uh, 2,500 years ago. And how was that? How, how did you feel after that? <laughs> oh, it was, um, you have to watch the film. The uh, olives have to, the olives stand up to the, and the figs to the Gatorade and the water. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, I, I did these training runs um, here in California for eight or 10 hours, only eating figs and it was fine. Ooh. But eating figs for 24 hours was a problem. I mean, why, why do we tell people to eat figs? Because you want to be regular, but when, <laughs> when you're, <laughs> when when you're, you're on the road, miles, you don't want to be regular. You know, that's the last thing you want. And oh, you know. Know, having eaten, I don't know, 40, 50, maybe 60 figs, oh, it kind of caught up with me at a moment. Yeah. Imagine what they went through and they did it. And they, I mean, until today, the stories of, uh, of our ancient Greek forefathers, the, the great military leaders, including Alexander the Great, uh, you know, Leonidas and, and the Athenians and just amazing stories. And I'm so happy that you uh, are keeping these uh, stories alive uh, and sharing them with a lot of Phil Hellenes. Um, I'd like to hear more about you, your background. So did you have a Forrest Gump moment in your life and you just started running? Something like that, I heard. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you started running and became such a great marathon runner. Well, I grew up in Southern California and in Los Angeles, and I went to St. Sophia. So I, I know that that's a, a church that many Greeks attend. It's a very um, prominent church in Southern California, St. Sophia. And the first recollections I have are from running home from kindergarten. I was the oldest of three, and when my um, youngest sister came along, my mom was having a hard time getting me home from kindergarten. So I just said to her, don't, don't worry about it, I'll just run. And, I, and she let me do this, and I loved to run. I just found that I hated sitting in class, you know, sitting still in class. I just wanted to run and be free. And so that was the, the, you know, the, the greatest 
gift ever was hearing that bell for class to be over and I could run home. And then I ran competitively until I was a teenager. And then I quit running altogether. Entirely stopped running. Um, you know, I went to uh, university, then I went to graduate school, and then I went to business school. And I had a very comfortable corporate job in San Francisco. And on the night of my 30th birthday, I was in a, in a bar um, doing what a lot of people do on their 30th birthday. I was, <laughs> I was drinking with my buddies. And at midnight, um, I told them I was going to leave. And they said, well, let's have another round of tequila, you know, for, to celebrate your 30th birthday. And I said, no, instead, I'm going to run 30 miles to celebrate my 30th birthday. And they looked at me and they said, but you, you're not a runner. You're drunk. And I said, yes, I am drunk, but I'm still going to do it. So I literally walked out of the bar and um, I didn't even own running gear at the time, but thankfully I had these comfortable silk, you know, boxer shorts on, silk underwear. <laughs> so I took off my pants and started running and I ran all night. It took me about eight hours. I ran straight through the night to a, a town uh, 30 miles south of San Francisco called Half Moon Bay. And that evening forever changed the course of my life. Wow, what an amazing story, Dean. I'd like to hear a little bit about your experience running in the South Pole. <laughs> extreme weather, talking about extreme weather. I mean, you run for hours, but was this days? And, and, and tell us a little bit about the harsh climate. Yeah, so I ran a marathon to the South Pole and it was supposed to be a group of 40 to 50 people that were gonna attempt to do this. It had never been done before. And there were three of us. And I quickly realized it's because the South Pole is a very dangerous place. <laughs> it gets very cold. I mean, very cold, minus 45 degrees cold. What, was there also danger from animals? Uh, any animals? Well, that's a good question. Um, people don't realize this. At the South Pole, there's, there's no life. There's no birds. There's, no, there's definitely no polar bears. There's no penguins. It's so harsh that nothing's alive there. And the Polar Plateau is the most barren place on earth. And all there is is wind and, and blowing snow. So, so um, is this a test against, I mean, is this a test of, hum, of human strength and endurance? Absolutely. I mean, I was supposed to be gone for, for 11 days and 30 days later, I, I you know, crawled back home. Oh no. We, we were living in a tent, there, was, there were seven of us living in a tent you know, the, the size of a, a, you know, a small bathroom and everything we had was frozen. Literally, if you wanted to brush your teeth, you had to sleep with your toothpaste in your mummy bag to warm it up enough. Every single thing we owned was frozen. We were running Would you do that? Would you do that again? Was it something like during your time, you know, when you were waking up and getting ready to go back out there, were you saying, what was I thinking? <laughs> I don't, I don't think I would do the South Pole again. I mean, in <laughs> hindsight, it's amazing none of us died. I mean, it was, that, it was kind of that dangerous. You know, there, there was, the plane broke down. We were stuck in the middle of nowhere. Uh, our solar chargers weren't working. You know, we had one satellite phone. There's no cell service, obviously. We had one satellite phone and we couldn't charge it because there was a whiteout, so there was no sun. It was, it was really a, a desperate situation. And it's amazing... We, we accomplished the marathon because I never, there were many moments where I thought we would never, never run a marathon to the South Pole. Wow, that's very telling. Uh, congratulations. That's a, it's a, <laughs> that's a huge feat that you all accomplished. And thank God you all came out of it alive and you show that, you know, humans can endure uh, when they're, you know, dedicated and, and they have an end goal. Um, you, you said something once and it really stuck with me. Uh, all Greeks have running in their blood. Um, it is, it is, it's in our blood to run a marathon. Can you just elaborate a little, expand on that a little bit more? You know, it's where we came from. I mean, if you look at us as a people, uh, we were, we were athletes. I mean, we, we valued our physicality. Um, you know, obviously we were uh, an intellectual, uh, crowd as well. We were thinkers, but we were also movers. And I think a lot of that has been lost over the ages. I, you know, when I go to Greece, it's, it's sometimes disheartening to me to see fellow Greeks that are not in good physical shape, that don't you know, appreciate uh, their physical body. And I'll never forget um, you know, getting a, a taxi one time uh, in Athens and um, telling the guy I was going running and the taxi driver said, you know, just be careful because Greek, you know, running is very new in Greece. 
I know. I, I was one of the first people jogging in the streets of Athens uh, in, in 1990. And my aunt was like, where are you going? And I was like, I got to go running. I was, you know, I was an athlete myself. I was a basketball player. I was like, I got to keep training. And she's like, you're running in the streets of Athens at 12 o'clock. And you're going to die. Like, you know, and people were like, what is she doing? You know, as I was walking, but, you know, running by blonde, they didn't think I was Greek. So I would hear all the, all the Greek, you know, <laughs> so you can relate. I mean, I laugh when he said, you know, running is very new in Greece because I'm thinking we've been running for, you know, millennials. I mean, you know, for yeah. three, 3,000 years we've been running. Well, I mean, Greece is beautiful. I'm so happy you discovered your roots. And, and so uh, what would you, what kind of, uh, uh, I would, I mean, what can you tell our fellow runners watching? Give us some tips on the three must do's during, during jogging or, or running or if everybody should be running. You know, I believe that every, every Greek should run a marathon. I really believe that. And people say, well, how far? They, a lot of people don't even realize how far a marathon is. It's 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers. And the reason I say that is because it changes you. You learn a lot about yourself. You, you finish the race as a different person than that person who was standing at the starting line. I mean, in those 26.2 miles of, of agony and torture and difficulty and hardship, you evolve as a person. And these lessons carry over from running into, into life. And that's why I think every Greek should run a marathon. It's, it's who we are. I mean, <laughs> you know, anyone who's an athlete who hears of marathon thinks of ancient Greece. That's absolutely true. Dean, thank you for representing Greece to, around the world as a marathon runner. Congratulations on everything you've done. We'd love to have you back here on In the Spotlight at on New Greek Television again very soon. And uh, in closing, where can any, everyone watch your wonderful documentary and get your book? Well, of course, um, you know, watch, go to the film festival. <laughs> That's where you can watch the documentary. The documentary is really hard to find because it's not available on Netflix or anywhere else. So it's very exclusive. So I encourage you to watch it on the, at the film festival. And then if you want to learn more about me, you know, just Google my name, Dean Carnassi. <laughs> you know, We're going to write all that down for our viewers. <laughs> we thank you so much for being on our show. Keep running and keep making us proud. Thanks for having me on and you do the same.